okay, we might as well go. People will be coming in uh, and don't worry about the sounds. You know, I'm gonna try to stop that. Uh, I want to say thank you so much to Daniel and Ellis to, to uh, agree to come on this for us. And I, uh, the, the, the whole theme for the discourse, for the dialogue, uh, is origin, method, and vision. Really pointing back to their background, to their history of martial arts, uh, their adventures in Japan, the teachers and the people they met along the way, and their intention behind their martial art, the intention be behind their Aiki or Aikido. Uh, we are not just limiting it to uh, Aikido, but the whole drive behind uh, what they are doing today, because there are quite pro um, proficient teachers and in, the, in what they are doing. And, um, and hopefully in the second session, you will be able to ask them all the questions that you have for them. Uh, of course, Alice has many, many books uh, that some of us, maybe many of us, has, has delved into and found really interesting. Um, so I would, and this is going to be a joint venture. Daniel and Alice are going to do this together. So we're not going to give Daniel the floor. We're not going to give Alice the floor. They're going to kind of feed off each other, uh, probably because they do probably, they probably crossed path a few times. If not, they have probably have friends to cross the path. So enough of this. So I said, uh, I give the first word to Daniel, Ms. Sisko, please, Daniel. Welcome. Okay, so let's see, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming and uh, thank you for setting this up, uh, Bjorn and Robert, and uh, nice to meet you, Ellis. You know, it's great and finally meet, meet you. and. Uh, so I'm just going to give a brief history. And, uh, you know, if I get that little too wordy, uh, hit a little buzzer and go, eh, time's up, okay, because I sometimes I don't know when to stop. People have often said I, I, I'm like a run-on sentence. You know, there's no periods or comments. Just go with goes. But uh, anyway, a brief history. Uh, I first became interested in martial arts back in 1964. I was 17 years old. And I started uh, Tang Sudo. Korean martial art. Most people have heard of Taekwondo, but Tang Sudo goes it's a little more uh, dated. And uh, I was doing that for a couple months and uh, ran into an Aikido dojo there in Detroit, Michigan. It was a uh, Yoshinkan, and the teacher Yasunari Yasudo was a 24-year-old Godan, and uh, he came over to study at Wayne University and uh, basically started the club and uh, through the judo club. And uh, so I started taking, I was doing Tang Sudo three times a week and Aikido three times a week. And, uh, you know, I started reading up on Aikido and, you know, heard about O Sensei. And they said, well, O Sensei's retired. You know, he turned it over to Gozo Shioda. And I go, really? That isn't what the magazines say, <laughs> you know? So, but anyway, uh, uh, eventually, after a couple of years, I was drafted into the military and, uh, Went to uh, Vietnam for a year uh, and went to Korea. And while I was in, after Vietnam, I was a medical corpsman over there in Vietnam. And after that, I went to Korea and uh, ended up staying in Korea. Uh, got married uh, and was studying Tang Sudo under the original Hong Gi as the sort of the old sensei of uh, Korea. And uh, then I would take trips to Japan to study Aikido at Hambu Dojo. And I said the first time in 1969. And just a short stay, and uh, got out of the military and uh, went to school in Korea, and was studying Tang Sudo. And I was again jumping between the countries, and that's why I met Tony. Also, I was saying about Tony was back in '74. I met him, so I stayed in uh, over there for two years studying Tang Sudo and Aikido together. And then uh, Saotomi Sensei at that time he was one of my favorite teachers over there. He moved to the states to Florida, so I followed him back. And I uh, was there in Florida with them for about two, three years, and then went back overseas again, and was living in Korea, and again jumping between the two countries. You know, two months in uh, studying Tang Sudo, two months studying uh, Aikido, and that went on for another couple of years. Came back, ended up in Boulder, Colorado. Ikeda Sensei, I better wrap this up real quick. You know, Ikeda Sensei for four years. I studied in uh, 
uh, Boulder, Colorado, and uh, then I uh, went to Hawaii for graduate studies and lived in Hawaii for about 12 years. And during that time, I was during the summers, I was going to all the seminars, ASU seminars in the States, and in the spring and the fall, I went to Japan to train. And uh, that went on for about 12 years. Uh, new wife, Japanese wife, Pennsylvania. Again, wrapped it up Pennsylvania three years, uh, studying at Dave Goldberg's dojo there. And then uh, after that, I went to Japan for four years uh, to my wife's hometown of uh, in Fukuoka, studied with uh, Subinuma Sensei for four years. Back to Ken Nesson's place for four years, Michigan for four years. <laughs> And now I'm in Davis, wrapping up eight years. I'm ready to move to San Diego next month. So this is my journey, <laughs> at least historical. <laughs> Ellis? So, uh, be quick. So I started martial arts a few years younger than you, Dan. Uh, I got into martial arts uh, when I was 12 years old, uh, sort of. I wanted to do karate and I kept nagging my parents. They thought it was a low class activity. My father got frustrated with me and dragged me downstairs, pulled out a two by four about this long and said, if you can break this with your bare hand, I'll let you do karate. And he figured I'd try it once or twice and give up and go on to other things. And cutting the story short, I used to get at one end of the basement, run full speed, smash my hand on the two by four, which was between two chairs unsecured until my hand was like so swollen I couldn't use it. And so I was eating left-handed and hiding it. I'd pull my sleeve over my hand. It took about a week for my parents to notice because I kept bumping my father while we were eating. And uh, you know, why are you eating left hand? I'm like, I'm eating continental. Because, you know, in America we shift to the fork the other hand. And uh, so he snatches up my hand, it's like a black, um, just, mound of flesh they thought i'd gotten my hand shut in a car door or something like that and i was like i did what you told me and my mother's now mad at my dad they wouldn't let me do karate because they thought i was crazy um when i was 16 i lost a fight pretty badly then they regretted their earlier decision i started doing backyard karate and, uh, for a couple of years i did something called kung fu wushu in new york uh, actually the base was in new york i did new haven connecticut and my dojo was a nation of Islam dojo. They needed a Jewish guy there. And uh, so and basically people would say, when the race war comes, we'll be killing each other. But until then, we're dojo brothers. Um, so, so, and I'm gonna cut this short, but I wandered into the 18th Street Aikikai after that dojo folded. And New York City was just captivated by Aikido. Started in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, I, I went to New York City and I lived in the Bond Street Dojo, which is one of our one degree of separation because the Bond Street Dojo was founded by Terry Dobson and Ken Nissen. So I slept on the mat for about, I don't know, nine months or so. Um, and during that time, and I think it was 1975, Kenny Collins and I drove down to Sarasota for Sao Tome Sensei's first week long training. Were you there, Dan? Yeah, I was there. <laughs> so we met each other then. Probably did, right? Yeah, I came. Me and Kenny came. I had a boken made out of a, a, a the zigzag boken made out of a birch tree, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. And everybody was laughing at me because it didn't look like anybody else's boken. But is, but uh, yeah, so we probably met back then. Uh, that was at the uh, Catholic uh, high school, right? Is where they had it. Was is there a different place? I just remember this really hot mat, this plastic mat, and it was like 110 mm -hmm. degrees or something like that. Yeah. Anywho, um, so I went to Japan. Uh, I, I, I was associated with the Kuomori Dojo, which is actually where Sao Tome Sensei started when he was a kid. Um, How old were you then? Pardon me? How old were you when you went first time? I was 23. Um, and I just decided I'm going. I had no idea if I was coming back or when or whatever. I, I sort of imagined I'd be there two years. And so I was doing the six hour a day, eight hour a day thing. I was traveling between dojos. I trained at Kuomori Dojo. I go to the Hombu Aikikai. 
I trained a lot with Kudo Iwa Sensei, uh, who was a former boxer. He was a Kayoi uh, Deshi. Yeah. He, he, uh, he lived outside. He didn't live in the dojo, but he was there all, as much as he could. Um, and he was a boxer who, um, and that's a long story. So the short version is he converted hooks and uppercuts and he overlaid them in Aikido. So he never did anything with an extended arm. Everything was on a figure eight pattern. Um, brilliant Aikido. Uh, very unlike anybody else's. Um, and I also trained with Nishio Sensei. Um, but I was only there about three months and I started training in Arakiryu. And Arakiryu is a 16th century um, martial art, a very rural uh, art that is very inclusive of weapons, everything from spear and naginata and nagamaki, which is a giant naginata, down to swords, daggers. And it focused on close combat. So it's a grappling system with whatever weapon you have in your hand. Um, it's one person I remember asked a friend of mine, well, what's our Aikido? Uh, and the guy said, well, it's the opposite of Aikido. Because the first thing you learn to do is to gain total trust from another human being. That's Kiai. And you offer them tea. And when they accept that, you assassinate them. And that was the first technique you learned. Uh, um, and they said, Sankyoku, these three there were three versions of it. Sankyoku Sannen. So for three years, in essence, that's all you do. It isn't, in fact, in terms of the training, but you are obsessed with the only reason to be doing this is for survival. And you annihilate your enemies. Uh, you don't give them a chance. It's no such thing as a fair fight. This is about how to survive in what was the 15th and 16th centuries. And I, it was just what I was looking for. Um, about that time, I withdrew from active Aikido training to only do that. Uh, but I was married at the time. My wife and I wanted to do something together. She was doing some Tai Chi. And Araki really wasn't suited for her. Uh, it's not suited for most, this is, sounds very sexist and I can get into that elsewhere if somebody wants, but it's not suited for most women uh, because it requires a lot of physical power. It requires a love of tradition and a willingness to have your face ground into a mat and come up laughing. And there's actually few men who like that either. And to have somebody who has all those components, loving tradition, willing to get injured and not mind, you know, all, all this kind of stuff, it's not suited for all that many people. And so I ended up my teacher's last student. Uh, he was very anti-foreign, particularly hated Americans, and he ended up with a Jewish guy from Pittsburgh because uh, all the Japanese people quit. But at any rate, my, my wife and I um, started training in Todahabu Koryu, which is another Koryu, which centers around the Naginata. And my teacher was Nita Suzio. At that time, she was in her 60s. She was about five feet tall. I was 6'6". Six, six. The two of us walking together was quite a spectacle. Uh, I became the first, I think the first male shihan in 150 years of that tradition, because it was very women-centered for quite a while. So I was doing these two different kodu with absolutely different operating systems. It's literally, I mean, the two metaphors would be like running a computer, which one day you're on Linux and the other day you're on uh, uh, the Apple system, and you're flipping from one to another. Or like being married to two people and trying to remember they live in different houses, they have no communication with each other, and so you go to one house on Monday and the other house on Tuesday, and you have to remember their name. Uh, so a lot of people, when they train in different kodyu, sort of mix them all together. And you lose the benefit of that because there's something utterly unique in each one. They're not just the physical techniques, there's the psychological techniques. Uh, there's uh, the esoteric training, which is crafted for the techniques. And so when you start to mix that, you get it generic. And so maintaining the separation is a mental challenge of its own. So anyway, doing those two kodyu, I would also cross train. I did judo, uh, singi. There was a wonderful teacher named Su Dong Chen that I trained in Japan. Come back to America after 13 years, continue training. Uh, I, when my body allows, I do something called a wrestling, which is uh, a mixed martial art for police. Uh, 
I continue training in uh, sort of internal strength training. Uh, I teach, I, I, blah, blah, blah. I, <laughs> I go on and on and on about it. But uh, I've now been doing martial arts for, what, about 45 years. Great. Wow. Um, a lot in a short space of time. Um, we have gone already half of the time, uh, 20 minutes. We got another 20 minutes for the first session. Mm. I love to, um, uh, uh, that you could, now you have laid out your whole life on martial art, but there's probably the, I'd like to pick out the points where you found like, um, I know that maybe you went into martial art for one reason, and maybe uh, you learned so much along the way, there is, so the reason changed. And what was, what was those points? That because in one way, maybe you had no, you had no, you have no uh, foresight into what those points could be when you when you stop when you come about them when you realize there was something much more to it, and what were what were those um, moments where where it took uh, you shifted up here, where where the martial art, where the budo or the bujutsu, uh, or the internal came into place and. Uh, how over the years have uh, the reasoning or the the per, uh, the reason to pursue it has that changed over time? So if I may go back to Daniel, but please be please be free to flow back and forth because this is you 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 do have a very interesting uh, some kind of similarities in your background. So don't feel that you have to give us all the info as, as a textbook. You know, it's like yes. Share some sure. stories. Uh, okay, like any young kid, I went into martial arts, of course, uh, self-defense oriented. You know, I, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan back in the 50s, 60s, and it was still sort of like in the, I think they saw the movie Grease or the music of Grease. There were, you know, these gangs on the corner and stuff, and you had to deal with this kind of stuff. So, you know, I wasn't much of a fighter, and I thought martial arts would help me. So I uh, went in with that sort of attitude, and... Uh, I think even for a while, because I did Tung Sudo and I Aikido together, I still wanted to have that sort of that guarantee in my pocket that I had the backup of Tung Sudo. You know, if Aikido didn't work, which I hate to say, then I had Tung Sudo, you know, that, that would uh, be the backup or the gun in the pocket, you might say, right? But, uh, you know, as time went on and uh, I felt there was more into Aikido than what I really should have been there, in there for. And... Uh, I like the practice, I like the way it felt. I like the way that when two people came together, you could sort of resolve this conflict, you know, in a way that both people hopefully would come out on, you know, equal. And, uh, but there was a, I was kind of, it's hard to say, but I was disappointed in a lot of ways in what the, where the training was going. And some of the teachers too, the teacher, I would be inspired by a teacher and I would start following a teacher. And then all of a sudden they wouldn't live up to my expectations. I would see failures in their character and what they were doing with their techniques. And uh, over a matter of time, I started to think, you know, well, what do I want out of Aikido? I dropped Tang Sudo at some point after 12 years and focused on Aikido. And uh, I was looking for something that really not only I could protect, protect myself, I guess, but also that had a greater meaning in my life. And so uh, I... At some point, I realized I couldn't find that with any teacher. And I went through a lot of them. I trained with so many different teachers. I went, you know, trained with uh, the King Kukai for a while. And every teacher has a great message they put out, but it was always, for me, it was lacking. And so at some, I, started, I decided at some point that I have to look into myself and say, what do I want out of this? What is it to me? And uh, I would look at videos of O Sensei, and I would always say, you know, there's something different about what he does and what everybody else does. I couldn't put my finger on it, but it was something different. And then at some, it just hit me one day. I was watching a video, and I realized that if you took away the UK, it would look exactly the same. Whereas with the other teachers, if you took away the UK, there would be an invisible UK you'd see them practicing with. There was this invisible UK that they were doing things with, and you can imagine them being there. So since he would move a certain way, and whether he was by himself or there was an UK, it looked exactly the same. And so I started moving my training in that direction. Maybe Aikido is not something you do, but who you are and how you move yourself. And so my training started revolving around that, where I would understand how my own body moves. And eventually this developed into what I call 
Aikido with an absolute perspective. In other words, instead of thinking about the duality of a relationship, I approach it in a way that I'm in the center and I'm always in the center no matter what. And so this changes the perspective. There's no such thing as next to, behind, in front of a person that wherever I go, I'm the center and everything's outside of that center. And having that perspective really has changed my practice so that uh, if someone was coming at me with an attack, I wasn't thinking, well, I have to go here or go there. I just went from here to here. And wherever here was, was the center. And the effect on them was that they always ended up on the outside of the circle. And they always ended up around me, wherever I went. And then just by changing the, the shape of my body, it would have an effect on them. So I'd move to this, from center to center and then lower myself and they would go down. Raise myself, they would go up. Move to forward and they would follow. And often, often liken it to a bird landing on my shoulder and it wants to be there and wherever I go, it goes with me. And so that's sort of where my Aikido is now, but it, it, I'm looking at not a sense of uh, an applied technique, but more about what I do and how that affects the world around me. So, I mean, in words, it doesn't make sense. You know, in practice, if I'm teaching a class and I'm demonstrating, then people can see the result of it. But to just talk about it is very difficult. Great. Right. Okay, so. So my, my trajectory is kind of different because I start, you know, when I got into Aikido, Terry Dobson was probably more sincere than almost anybody that Aikido is going to save the world. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people paid lip service to it. He had a desperation to make it true. Uh, and so I, I started out with that belief. I was one of Terry's boys for a while. Uh, I, it lasted about a year, year and a half. And then I went back to what I was interested in before, which was, you know, I'm interested in learning all these different fighting arts just because, nothing bigger than that. And my Aikido teacher, one day, I, I, I've been there about nine, 10 years, and because he followed the adult learning model, he was very gentle with me. He said, you know, you're a waste of breath. You're a waste of time and a waste of breath. He says, what are you here for? You've been here like 10 years. You left your home, you left your own culture, thinking you were gonna to go to Japan and learn something. What did you wanna do, be enlightened? That's masturbation, that's selfish. It has absolutely no use and no value in the world. The only reason to do martial arts is to exert power on the world and other people. And he said, I truly don't care if you're a policeman or a terrorist, but if you aren't exerting power on other people, you're just a masturbator. And I thought about that. And I wasn't, you know, I was teaching English. I was working in an automatic labeling machine factory, writing, uh, trying to translate the Japanese of the technical manuals into English. And that's why the machines didn't work so well. Uh, um, and I didn't want to do what my teacher was doing with his life because he was very much living what he said. Uh, Japan is a different place because of him in some very quiet ways. Uh, but without going into all those stories, I got ashamed of my life. And so I ended up going back to America and getting into, I found that one of the most interesting things for me in training was kiajutsu. And kiajutsu is not just squawking out a yell uh, to punctuate a form. Kiajutsu is it's the opposite of Aiki in the way the characters are written, but it basically means organizing yourself and organizing the relationship between you and other people. And so in the training I was doing, and that was for the destruction of somebody else. So based on my own morality, how could I flip that around? I got into crisis intervention. And uh, so my career, uh, since I returned to America, has been everything from working uh, in child protection, dealing with both the children who've been abused and the abusers, um, working in frontline mental health, which is dealing with individuals who may be in a psychotic state, may be homicidal, may be suicidal, and moving them, exerting power on them, quite frankly, so that they are less inclined to do those things. Uh, 
in the process, I ended up writing a lot of books. Uh, I got recruited for a DARPA project, uh, which was called, was called the Good Stranger Project. How do you train war fighters and police to maintain tactical advantage while establishing the maximum of respect and rapport with people who will always be your enemies? So in other words, not how do you become friends? You're, never, you're an occupying force, you're never gonna be friends. But how in that circumstance do you achieve a state of some kind of respect and minimizing the possibility of violence? So that statement from my teacher was what really pushed me. Uh, a second real quick transition was when I got back to America, uh, I was, excuse me, I was uh, teaching at Aikido in a friend's dojo. It was an Aikido dojo. And he, there were four teachers in this dojo. And there was some politics because none of them were in the same organization. And my friend was leaving, it was his dojo. And he was really afraid that one of the other teachers would steal all his students if uh, that guy took his classes while he was gone. And so he asked me to teach Aikido. And I said, I don't do that. I don't like Aikido. And he said, well, you owe me. And I got this problem that I always pay my debts. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to do it, but I owed him because he was letting me use his dojo. So I started teaching Aikido and all of a sudden it became interesting again. And what became interesting for me was the puzzle of from the huge, the huge um, corpus of Daitoju, why did Ueshiba select out this limited range of techniques which seem to have no relation in my view to each other? I mean, what, you know, five wrist locks and one pressure point and et cetera, et cetera. And I started looking at it and I realized that every form could, every waza could fit on one of five vectors. Uh, and I, Ikkyo, or I call it Ikkyoku, the theme of the first form, is everything from Funakogu to Tenkan to uh, Ikkyo. Every movement that's on this uh, vertical plane. Nikkyoku is a, a figure eight movement on a horizontal plane. Sankyoku is a spiral up. Yonkyoku is a spiral down, and Gokyo, if you think about it, is a straight movement. It's the pure Irimi of like a spear. And so I realized you could chart every Aikido movement on these five vectors. And I, for a while, was teaching at Aikido Dojo. And what was remarkable was if you focused on those five vectors as your main teaching point, students quickly picked up the essence of technique. And you had people spontaneously doing good kaishi waza on their seniors after a month's practice. Because whenever the technique would deviate from the vector, their body, because they were obsessively doing the solo training, their body would want to go on the vector line, which would be the kaishi waza. So the, if you will, the second moving point for me was that in terms of Aikido. And all of a sudden I started really, really liking Aikido again. Because uh, it sort of distills down that way of, uh, of, of movement. Wow, that's great. Great to hear. Um, we have uh, eight minutes left on this session. Please do not write your uh, questions now because they might be deleted when we shut down this session. And we have a 10 minute break and then we open up the same uh, the same ID with the same password afterwards. I do, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to keep the questions. So uh, write your questions when we come back. But um, so this last thing, Alice, that you spoke about sounded really, really interesting. And uh, and I heard I, I heard other stuff about how how Olson say distilled in one way uh, his. <laughs> technical rapport um, to, to, to fit uh, uh, certain principles that, that would constitute the essence. And I was wondering, Daniel, if you, if you like something uh, of Austin Say's uh, uh, work bringing about Aikido from Daitori in the technical sense in that, in, in that way, and how that may be uh, how maybe that lends itself also to Austin says more uh, uh, well if we would uh, I would love to bring in also say spiritual uh, uh, ideology 
his uh, his wordings because I know sometimes it's uh, seen as uh, uh, esoteric interior work, but also as a as a mental uh, philosophical um, understanding uh, with it. So if well, you, can... you know, I, I said I started in Yoshinkan, and I guess that's about as close as you can get to some of the earlier. Uh... Uh, you know, Daichiru techniques in a lot of way. I mean, everything was sort of by the book. And uh, the Oshinkan uh, uh, study, there, you know, a Tenkan was 100, I think it was a 185 degree turn or something. Everything was precise, you know, where the hands were, where the feet were. And if you did it a certain way, it worked. If you, did it, if you didn't do it that way, it didn't work. If you didn't have the right angles, the right vectors, as uh, Ellis was saying, it wouldn't work. You know, it had to be, there had to be these certain rules about how these techniques work. So I came into Aikido very, you know, enthralled with that ideal that, you know, I'm going to learn these things and if I do them right, they're going to work. And, you know, and I'm going to focus on doing it right. And so that was, again, that was the origin of my study. I'm really glad that I did start off that way. Because I think for a lot of people that started off, maybe an Aikido guy, you know, there was really not a whole lot of structure. There was sort of every teacher had their own method of teaching. You know, and it was, uh, you could go any way you wanted to. I mean, Else to tell you, you know, from they had Arikawa Sensei, who was just a bone breaker, you know. <laughs> you have a Watanabe Sensei, who at one point went off into another realm completely, you know. And uh, so there's there's all these different ways you can go. And, and so, like I said, I followed a lot of teachers. Satomi Sensei was my main teacher, uh, but I did train with a Suganuma Sensei, who was like basic waza, you know. His classes were all the same, Ichinikyo Sankyo, and he really focused on those. Uh, then with uh, Takeda Sensei and the Kenkyu Kai, who had his own, his own version of Aikido, totally different. And uh, so my, I just felt that at some point that, uh, you know, I didn't need to go through, at least after years of training, that uh, there's a direct connection to the, the truth. That uh, we don't need to, we don't need the Pope, or we don't need uh a great teacher to sort of continuously guide us. They inspire us, but at some point you have to find out what Aikido means to you in particular. And for, it's different for every person. And uh, I think that uh, my, I mean, I don't think the old sensei was perfect. You know, I see some of his stuff that he does, and sometimes I go, ooh, I don't like that. You know, that doesn't fit into my realm of what Aikido is. But, uh, you know, again, he's a, I was inspired by him, I was inspired by the things he said, but at some point, I came to trust my inner feeling about what I wanted from Aikido. And uh, I, like I said, I divided Aikido into two realms. The Aikido in the relative world and Aikido in the absolute world. In the relative world, you can take it to the highest heights. You can have, I mean, I'm amazed. I've always said that I'm amazed by what uh, Tessier Sensei and uh, Bruno Gonzalez said, some of how beautiful the technique is. And then you see some other person who's really got precise technique or somebody has their own style. That's all beautiful. But... There's a whole other paradigm, and that paradigm is the Aikido with an absolute perspective. And uh, that, that's what I practice now, and I, I feel that a lot of what I read, what Osensei says now, fits into that. When he talks about, all I do is stand here and all things come to me. All things come to me, the attractive force. And I feel this attractive force so strongly that when I move in the paradigm of the absolute perspective, I'm moving around the map, but I'm not moving around the map. The map's moving around me. It's like a video game. It's a strange feeling. I walk around, the whole dojo adjusts to me. And as I move, the attacker adjusts to me. And everything that happens adjusts to me. So there's no longer front, back, side, nothing. I am always the center. And the effect it has on the attacker is it leaves them in this, they get sort of sucked into this gravitational field around me. And... Uh, I really feel that somehow this touches on what Osensei had in mind. Again, I don't know. I don't want to say I know Osensei, I know what he was thinking or anything like that. You know, I leave him with all my other teachers. He inspired me, but now I feel that I, I'm directly talking to the spirit that he was connected to and not, you know, looking back and, and comparing notes. Would he do this? Would he say that? And I can't do that. When I gave up my other teachers, I gave up him too. And so my Aikido is my Aikido. Great, that, that's fantastic. And w w hearing your last sentence, we only have a minute left. We're going to take 10 minutes and come back. But actually, uh, yeah, hold back your questions because there's so much coming out of these two. They haven't even got started yet. So let's see if they can just bring the, uh, continue this. I'll see you in 10 minutes. Same, pass, uh, same password, same ID number. 
Ellis, Daniel, we can go back on our private uh, private um, Zoom and uh, chat unless you need to go to the for a break. See you. Oh, no, okay. 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 See you in ten. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Okay. All right.